So good evening, everyone, and also thank you, Gid. And firstly, thanks for joining us for um, tonight's webinar, taking time out your busy day, I'm sure. So my name is Nia Davis. I'm the Research and Development Officer for Herbie Kikoli in Promotion Wales. And I'm delighted to bring to you tonight's webinar, uh, Getting Started with Rotational Grazing, Principles, Practices and Tips. And tonight we'll be learning about how rotational grazing works on the basic principle of grazing nest with increased grass growth quality, leading to better conversion rates for lamb, beef and dairy producers alike. So um, tonight's webinar is being delivered part of the GrassCheck TV project, which is a um, collaboration between HCC, uh, QMS, Quality Meat Scotland, HGB, together with DL, Northern Research, um, Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute, and of course, industry, industry sponsors across the UK. So we have three speakers tonight. Um, joining us is um, James Daniels, founder and director of Precision Grazing, John Frizzle, business development manager for Data Mars Livestock UK, and Dane Deborder, uh, young stock and grazing management for Pomeroy Farm, which is one of our 50 farms in the GrassCheck TV project. So tonight's um, the way tonight's going to run. We'll start with James and John who are doing a joint presentation. Um, it'll be around 30 minutes in length, and then we'll have a brief question and answer session. And then Dane will run through his presentation, which will take around 10 minutes, and there'll be time for comments and questions at the end. Uh, we'll aim to finish around 8 pm. So, um, without further delay, I'll uh, introduce our first two speakers for tonight. James was introduced to Management Grazing Systems in New Zealand in 2015. And since then, has worked with livestock farmers uh, across the UK to help them adopt profitable pasture based and grazing systems. And John, our resident Kiwi, with very extensive knowledge uh, and practical hands on experience with livestock management systems, including livestock pasture and pesticide management with fencing, both permanent and electric fencing solutions. So, um, yeah, um, enough of me, over to you, James and John. There we go. Right, sorry, guys. So, just uh, yeah, I'm going to find the mute, mute button. Um, so yeah, good evening everyone, um, thanks for everyone who's joining us, um, it's always a, it's a bizarre thing doing these webinars, um, I can see there's about 120 people on the, um, in the meeting this evening, but obviously we can't see any, any of your faces, so um, it's always a strange strange thing doing these, lesson feedback, but uh, there's a chat function, um, so if you've got your questions then please place them in the chat, um, me and John will take any questions you have at the end of our session, um, and again there'll be some time at the end, so um, yeah please you know, Anything you, you think of um, or anything you want to ask as we go through, um, just place in the chat and we'll, we'll definitely come to you. Um, so with that, where we go, and thanks Nia for the introduction, and yeah, thanks um, John and Datamars for inviting me to speak to, to you all this evening. Uh, what we're going to run through is, um, yeah, to sort of go through grazing management, um, sort of why we may do it um, and how, into some of the methods. Uh, John's going to give us some to give you guys some tips, um, sort of tips and tricks um, with regards to infrastructure, particularly electric fencing. We'll then have a look at sort of when you might do it on farm and say take those questions at the end. Sorry, James, just to, before you carry on, um, people are struggling to hear you. Can you get a little bit closer to your speaker or do you have a headset? I don't have a headset with me, um, but uh, yeah, I can move, move closer to the screen if that's easier. Perfect, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, okay, guys, yeah, so anyone who can't hear very well, then um, like I say, let us, let us know in the chat and we'll see if we can amend it. Um, so as I said, Nia, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm James Daniel, um, Director of Precision Grazing. We're a farm, so we're a farm consultants um, and there's a team of three of us, myself, um, Rhys Williams, yeah, who lives in the Clinton Peninsula in Wales, and Sarah Morgan, who's in Shropshire. So together we, we work with sheep, beef and dairy farmers across the UK. Um, particularly, well, sorry, particularly in, in England and Wales. And we do a number of things. We're involved in research projects um, around grazing systems. Um, we get involved with the business management side and planning side. 
of the farm. And then we also look at the grazing management and everything we do can be tied back to um, pasture-based production systems. And we're interested in and concerned with uh, low cost, um, you know, low cost, productive and sustainable or now regenerative um, production systems. So to help us do that, we work with uh, Farming Connect in Wales and we lead a number of discussion groups for the pasture, the Prosper from Pasture project there. Um, and we also have a, our own discussion groups, which we run in England, and actually they're running conjunction with Liz Geneva. And so during, during COVID and during lockdown, we run those virtually and we're hoping to be back on farm of those groups in October. So if you're on the call and you would like to join a, a group of like-minded people um, that are perhaps striving to improve their management of grass, then check out our website, precisiongrazing.com, and there's a, a link to, to sign up for the groups there. Uh, John, I might just let you give a brief intro to yourself and then um, yeah. get into it. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks, James. Thanks, Nia, for the introduction. Hi, everybody. Jo I'm John Frizzell, Business Development Manager with Datamars Livestock. In the UK, Datamars has three distinct product categories with a range of leading brands. Livestock and identification, LID, which is Z-Tags and Tag Faster. Animal Health Delivery System, AHDS, which is Simcoe and NJ Phillips. And Farm Resource Management, FRM, with TrueTest, Speedrite and Hayes. Works better together. You'll hear more from me later. Over to you, James. Yeah, cool. Thanks, John. So, um, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people listening would have recognised some of those brand names. Um, and so John will... We'll, um, yeah, we'll give a sort of contribution as we get on to the infrastructure side. So we thought we'd start with the why, and I appreciate there's probably a wide range of backgrounds and experiences and systems um, with us this evening, um, but hopefully we can find some common common whys to um, to go. So, you know, from the farms we've worked with, um, and I'm sure as many of you might realise, uh, your farm, your net profit is directly proportional to how much pasture you grow and utilise. So if you surveyed 100 farms and put them in order of pasture grown and used, the net profit generally rises as they grow and utilize more pasture. It's not just about growing the pasture, it's about using it. And um, we'll discuss that a bit later on. Also on farm, and we, we you know, take a good interest in the um, HDB farm bench um, and some of the other national surveys that are done across the country. And what we tend to find, and this is the average farm, this is, we'll put the, Average in, um, in quote marks, there's, there's obviously no such thing, but generally speaking, subsidy comes in, it goes or gets spent on concentrate feed and nitrogen fertilizer. The farmer gets a calendar and a hat, um, but there's actually no change in farm profit at the end of it. So we'll see, if, unfortunately, sometimes a good correlation on farm between these, the money spent on these two inputs don't lead to any more profit. So they're not delivering a really actually a good return or any return on that, on that investment. Obviously, and here, you know, subsidy is going to reduce and, and change pretty shortly. Um, and if we're buying in these inputs, then we're effectively buying in feed to the farm. So are we going to be able to afford to buy these in? And if we don't, how are we going to be able to provide enough food on farm for the stock we're currently running? And we think we can achieve this. We know we can achieve this um, by some simple changes in our grassland or grazing management. And that sort of links us nicely to this slide. Um, and there's a, we're trying to sort of teach you or, or put across some simple rules of thumb. And there's a really nice one to remember. It's just one, two, three ratio. So if we imagine grass for the cost of one, as soon as you put a tractor over it or through it, um, i.e. to make it into silage, uh, bales or clamp, then you double the cost of that feed. If you get your feed delivered in the farm, either hopefully not in bags, but maybe in bulk and blow into a bin, then that feed is costing you, you know, at least three if sometimes four times the cost of grass. So anything you buy in, you've really got to ask yourself, um, do I need to buy it or can I find a way of changing my, gra my grazing management or just tweaking my system to, to remove or to reduce that cost? On the, the bigger picture, and I know a lot of our clients are interested and aware of, and I'm sure some of you on the call are, um, carbon footprint, directly proportional to how much pasture or how much you grow, to how you grow and utilize your pasture. So again, a, a grazing animal eating the grass in the field, 
if we take the animal emissions aside for a minute, um, there's no diesel being burnt to, to harvest that crop and take it into the animal. And so we know those systems, again, have a lower carbon footprint, so they're burning less diesel, they're importing less feed. Then we might ask why pasture? Well, it's, it's reasonably simple. Pasture, so when I say pasture, I mean grass, clover, and, um, and herbs and forbs. They're, they're really awesome. They grow everywhere, even when they're not meant to. They're high quality, or nearly well, always high quality when managed. Perfectly suited for cattle and sheep. Low cost, zero or even negative carbon, again, with the, the correct management. And by grazing pasture that's managed well in the right system, we know we can increase the quality of meat and milk. And we know that quality is very important when we're comparing the quality of meat. It really helps to offset some of maybe that carbon or environmental footprint um, compared to some of the other, other produce. So lots to go at, a lot, lots of good of surrounding pasture. The tricky thing is that sometimes it just seems so damn hard to manage. So how do we or how could we manage it? So you think about your role as a farmer. Farmers wear many hats, agronomy, nutrition, vets, builders, fencers. Um, but if we try and simplify that and think about the livestock side, the role of the farmer is to supply the right quantity and quality of feed at the right time so stock can, can express their genetic potential. So if you're a farmer on the, on the meet, in the meeting and you've, you know, you, you're interested in your EVVs and your stock genetics and you've You've gone out and spent a thousand pounds on a ram, or maybe three or four thousand pounds on a bull. The curious thing is that um, the investment you've made in those genetics, you only see those genetics express their potential if you supply the right quality and quantity of feed at the right time. I know a few people have perhaps been disappointed in the investment they've made in new rams, um, you know, simply because they've not allowed that stock to, to express their potential. They've been underfed at a key time. So how do we do so? Well, as a farmer, we, it's really useful to have an understanding of how, what feeds your animals need and what feed the farm has. So we think about those, we have the demand and the demand on this graph is the red line and we have the supply and the supply on this graph is pasture growth or on a farm it might be supplementary feed, it might be forage crops, it could be silage. The tricky thing with pasture is that it fluctuates, the growth fluctuates through the year and not every year is the same. As a farmer, the demand of our stock is reasonably fixed year to year and it's really influenced by a mating date and how, how quickly the animals are growing. But if we can get to know our systems and know what our demand is, so in this system we're looking at in April, the farmer's got a demand in early April of 20 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day. And kilos of dry matter per hectare is what we measure our grass in. So I looked at a field and that field was six centimetres high. Then I might I could express that as something around 2,000 kilos of dry matter per hectare. And obviously the stock would use some of that. We wouldn't let them use all of it because if they used all of it, they would graze into the soil and it would take a long time to grow back, if at all. So the farm we're looking at needs to grow 20 kilos a day for the first two weeks of April. Obviously, if it was measuring its grass in this season, it found that in early April, the grass growth was nearly 40 kilos. And so that's where measurement comes in. It allows you to see against what you need, what the farm's doing, and helps to hopefully pull out or pinpoint some of the surpluses or deficits on the farm. The surplus is an opportunity. They can also be a problem if we lose quality because we're growing too much grass too quickly. The deficits are generally more of an issue. So deficits mean stock are underfed and we can see in March, we have a feed deficit. We have a supply that's less than we need. So if you're not measuring grass, that's where something like the grass chip project comes in. Because you can hopefully find a farm that's in your region that's reasonably comparable. You can look at what they're doing and you can maybe try and start to apply the growth for that region back to your farm. But obviously you need to know your demand first. And what's the potential? You know, if we if we tweak and if we focus on grazing management, we can really improve and increase what the farm can produce per hectare. And there's that great saying, they're not making any more land and land's not getting any cheaper. If you're fortunate enough to own land, then investing in your own land will give you the best return. You're improving your asset, improving your net worth. So if we move from set stocking, 
we may grow six tons of dry matter a hectare a year and utilize about 70 percent of it as we reduce how long animals spend in a field and that's the far left column so that's days per field as that gets less so as we move animals more often we allow the grass more time to recover and also because we're not spending so much time in the field we don't eat the regrowth so if we can graze the grass plant once and then get off it and let it grow back without changing any of our inputs or pasture species um, we will start to grow more grass and we'll just start to utilize a bit more grass as well and you can see the sort of size of the prize on the right hand side that a farm that was set stocked could almost sort of double its potential grass growth um, by moving the animals more often now the trouble of growing more grass is that we might need to have more animals and that's a you know, always a bit of a, a concern we hear sometimes um, the thing to focus on and to be aware of is that just because you're going to grow you can grow more grass doesn't mean you've got up your stocking rate and sort of you know get busier and work harder no what we want to do first is you want to look at the opportunities in the business and say where are we a bit tight for feed you know where are we have to spread fertilizer to get ourselves out of a hole where do we think we're under feeding stock and could grazing management help us out in those periods So I'll just so here we've got a, um, a graph. We've got months along the bottom, so we're January through to December, and the green line is the farm cover. So that's height of grass on farm as it tracks through the year. We see in this farm the cover, so the height of grass on farm in March, so just before lambing, is getting really low. And we'd sort of say there that, that was you know low to the point where it could impact flock performance. And worst case, a cold April meant that as ewes hit the peak lactation, they'd be underfed. It may be a cattle farm and it's trying to turn out cattle and it's, you know, its covers are plummeted and it's going to underfeed stock. So to correct this situation, the hard work or the effort should have been focused over here in September, October. We can see that in this graph. So by rotational grazing, by increasing the amount of grass grown and used on farm through August, September, October, November, the farm was able to improve to lift the amount of grass on farm in the autumn, and that helped carry the stock through so it started the spring with more grass. And spring's really important. A farm will grow 40% of its annual production or annual production potential happens in the spring. So if a farm could grow 10 tons in a year, then potentially four of those tons will occur in March, April, May, but they'll only occur if the farm's got some grass on it. Great saying, grass grows grass, you need some leaf area on the farm. So rotational grazing is not about just increasing stock numbers and, and trying to max things out. If used correctly or if used strategically to increase grass growth when there's a deficit or increase grass growth before there's a deficit to help carry you through, and if we think about the farm we're looking at now in the second example, they wouldn't need feed supplements at lambing time. So maybe that's that five or 10 grand cost saving straight away. Okay, so just conscious of time, we're going to bring, uh, bring John into us, into this, um, and look at how we might achieve this on the farm. So there's lots of different grazing systems, but perhaps the term I like to use is managed grazing. So in a managed grazing system, animals simply move regularly to a new pasture in a planned way. And what we know is we know there's lots of methods. And if you're on social media, every second photo you see, if, you're, if you're, um, your Twitter feed's like mine, is a, um, a different grazing system with a different name. Um, so in essence, they're pretty much all doing the same thing. Um, the most common where people probably start is rotational grazing. So these are all managed grazing systems. Animals are moved in a planned way, and they're all trying to achieve the same thing. They're trying to graze the plants once, and then give them a rest, and then come back to them when they're ready to graze again. So quite simply, some simple rules to follow. If the group of animals you run, so your flock or your herd, can't graze a field within five days, then add more animals or make the field smaller. So, and we can come back to some, some of that stuff a bit later on. So here we are, we've got a big field, and for the, let's say it's 100 Jews and lambs, we 
want to put in it because that's the size of flock that we're happy with um, maybe treating or we can get in our yards um, for, for a whey or for a vaccination. Um, they can graze it within five days. Actually, it's a 20 acre field that's going to take, they're going to be in it a month before they've grazed it out. So way to overcome that is to split that field in four and four paddocks per group is the kind of minimum that we, we would like to see as part of a managed grazing system. So it doesn't, have, it doesn't mean splitting a field, it might be four fields. And that's normally the easiest way to start, is to have four or five fields and just make sure the field, they can graze that field in five days. If your fields are big, then you may need to split the fields. And obviously this is a lovely rectangular field, which um, I'm sure yeah, matches all the fields you've got at home. Um, so if you're gonna have a go at this, um, or maybe you're doing it already, then I'm sure temporary electric fencing is where you're gonna start. So John, just wanna run us through, um, yeah, what makes up a temporary electric fencing system? Yeah, it's a cost effective way of getting into it. Um, so on the left there, you've got a, a sheep, a simple sheep system there um, with a poly wire, some geared reels, poly posts, a Zama handle connected into a, a, one of our new solar energizers so to get you started with some um, sheep break grazing. On the right is a simple cattle, uh, one line pigtails, similar with one of our battery uh, energizers. So cost effective way of getting, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money, 200 pounds will get you up and running um, and you're set to go and you can build from that. Yeah, and we're going to look at those those components in a bit more detail as we, um, yeah, as we head in a little bit further. So, um, so this is an example actually taken from, from one of our clients. Um, so we've got the, the fence distances. Um, so it's four or two largest fields that have been split up into each been split into four to make eight paddocks. Now, you know, there's little, little things you can do to make life easier. You've got to get water to all the paddocks. Um, four to six paddocks is the minimum. Eight is, is a good number to start with. But again, three paddocks or three fields, gates closed, water to each field, move the stock once a week. That will get you started with rotational grazing. That will rest more of the farm and that will grow a little bit more grass. And as we head into September or October, that's going to be pretty valuable. If we move the system forwards, maybe we've got a bigger field, or I think for a lot of people who start with temporary fencing, is temporary fencing is great, really cost effective, really flexible. You can wrap it up, move it, put it out again. But you know, maybe 12 months or 24 months down the line, you get a bit fed up with moving fences, particularly if they're always going back in the same place. So that kind of leads us, and this is what we'd see on obviously on a lot of dairy farms. Um, is to a permanent electric fencing. So what's what's different here, John? What are we, what are we using? A bit more substantial. I mean, we've got insulators there for a start. So you, you're needing to strain your wire. So we've got what we call inline wire strainers there, aluminium. So you'll put them in the middle of your fence to get a good strain. Um, the bulk of permanent fencing will be you, you move on to, from the poly wires and the tapes onto a, a hopefully cyclone uh, high tensile 2.5 wire very conductive, um, low resistance, and that'll take that uh, pulse, you know, a good distance. So you've got, um, from the left, you've got the, your energizer in, up into a cutout switch, um, and then in, into the fence line. So the benefits are there, is, as you were saying, is cost effective, um, and, and you can, from there, you can cut your fields up, and um, you've got a current running around your farm. Underground cable there, so you're taking a current under a grate, so you use one of our underground cables, which is uh, a premier um, insulated cable. Um, so you can go down under the ground and back on up again. So the key thing with uh, the electric fencing is a circuit. You want to keep that intact and, and keep the current flowing. Another feature there just on the health and safety side of things is a warning sign. So if you're near public uh, walkways or public access uh, drives, you need to um, put a warning sign every 100 meters. So just to highlight the bit of health and safety tonight. Um, but you can see there also our claw uh, insulators. They've got a spark guard, stop arcing. Um, so, uh, you know, you're looking at, uh, you know, going to permanent, it's always a good idea to look at some quality accessories. Um, to, you know, you'll get light, a long longitudinally life. And as I say, it's all about um, that conductivity and keeping the resistance low. Yeah, that's key, keeping focus on so the I just the drawing I, I, I showed above again. We're we're thinking this is a large field, and if we've got big fields and we think about our returns, so what the best return on our investment, then splitting those fields, splitting your biggest fields in half, whether it's with temporary or permanent fencing, 
we always give you the quickest return. So if it took stock, your largest group you could put together, if it's taken them 10 days to graze the field, and by taking 10 days, they were quite selective. They were leaving the weed grasses and they were running to seed. By simply breaking that big field in half, either lengthways, and lengthways gives you, gives you options maybe to sort of break fence it, um, particularly good for cattle, or even through the middle to make sort of square paddocks, and that's really good for, for sheep, particularly ewes and lambs. A 10 day field goes to two five day fields. And you know, if you imagine your field, your farm was full of two hectare paddocks, by necessity, you'd hopefully be moving stock more often and growing more grass at the right time of the season. So we just put this one in for interest. This is a cattle system. This is a 4.7 hectare field. It's a 13 acre field. And you know, it actually costs um, about 2,000 pounds to set this field up. You think, my God, that's a lot of money to throw into a field. Um, but if you're going to reseed it, um, that's pretty much what you have to spend on the reseed. Um, you're thinking about 500 pounds a hectare for reseeding, and it's probably a little bit closer to six at the moment. Um, so a quite a bit of an investment, but it broke that field up into 16 paddocks, um, and it put four water troughs in that field. Each water trough services services four paddocks. Um, what that field did in year one, with the same inputs of fertilizer and with the same cattle, is in Increase live weight per hectare by 50%. And that was run as a trial. So next door, again, permanent pasture field with the same group of cattle, just uh, they were split in half. They were set stocked under the owner's normal management. They ran a larger area um, and proportionally, say, per hectare, kilos of live weight per hectare, the subdivision uh, or the grazing management, the, that grazing rotation we can see set up, increased live weight per hectare. So really quick gain. And that returns that gave that return on investment in that 12 month period. So it's quite interesting. You know, of all the things you can spend money on in farming, um, actually, water trough, water pipes, and electric fencing gives you probably one of the best returns as long as you've got the stock to eat the grass or you're eating it at the right time. Just a key one to note, I think, before we move on is paddock shape, four to one ratio. So we don't want long, thin paddocks because animals will track in wet weather. The squarer the, the, pot, the, squarer, the better. Well, John, we'll, um, I think, what, a minute and a half, and we'll see if we can uh, get through this next little section. We'll get on to some tips, but this is a range of our, you know, speed ride uh, energizers. So, you know, starting from the big boys, you know, we can head out with the um, the A15XI there, um, and then the energizers, which is a three-in-one. You can work solar, battery, or mains with those. Uh, so, say, uh, entry sort of level, hobby farm type uh, battery energizers. And they're exciting new solar energizers there with the S1000, S500, S150, and S80. In fact, Alad uh, Evans and Alice Davidson, um, Whiskgrass, Czech UK, uh, GB have, um, have been trialing these and we're absolutely delighted with their comments. Um, fantastic response from them, really positive. And it's, it's a really nice bit of innovation. Um, speed, uh, right, it's very much about innovation. Manufactured in New Zealand since 1938 and um, really ahead of their game when it comes to R&D. And we've got further products coming out later this year with regards to um, Wi-Fi uh, um, mains energizers. So it's really exciting times for us. Yeah, Just I think for, for me, so, solar is a, a really good one to go with because if animals break out, it's generally because lack of voltage and nine times out of 10 is because you forgot to change the battery. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, just a rule of one, one joule of um, output energy would basically it will give you roughly 10 kilometers of uh, fence. And yeah. just on to the earthing, as I say, it's uh, some tips. This is the most important, well, this is the important part of the, the fence uh, to get the performance. Uh, it's the most effective, you know, to get effective earth system is really important. Um, rule of thumb there, follow the three, two, one rule, three meters. Uh, three meter space between the earth stakes, two meters into the ground, galvanized, and one continuous feed from earth bar to earth bar. And just to hint there, just to keep away from uh, 10 meters away from your bu building earths or you know, any other earth systems. Uh, but as I say, uh, to get a real you know, effective earth is really important. Um, if there's going to be a problem in the electric fence, nine times out of 10, it'll be inadequate earthing. Or you've you know you've got a dry area, you want to look at very much moist area for the earthing system. 
check it out. You, you don't, you know, if you can get away from your farm buildings, all the better. But just find a, uh, you know, a moist area and, and get the earth bars in. It's it's um, time well spent. Yeah, yeah, and I'd second that. And you, yeah, your earthing system doesn't have to be right next door to your energizer. If you, especially if you've got some permanent electric, you can probably run it up to 400 meters from your energizer. So go out and find that wet spot on the farm, and um, yeah, put those earth bars in. And you know, if you haven't got a wet spot, maybe think about somewhere you can water that earthing system. And we've yeah, certainly saw guys needing to do that in May this year to keep the voltage up on the fence. So talking of fence voltage, um, yeah, what do these guys do, John? These are well, it's a really good side of the there. Another bit of innovation there is our remote with fault finder on the left there. So that basically you'll be you'll be out the back somewhere and you'll think, oh, something's not right here. Um, that fault finder will, will, will fold, it'll find the fault. Um, it'll give you an arrow direction where the fault is. You can uh, turn your fence off, do the repair, turn it back on. Happy days. So that's as I say, innovation there. It's fairly unique to us, um, and that links in with our mains energizer and our. Uh, 15 joule uh, unigizer. Uh, the, the voltmeter in the middle there is, is also you know, a very good tool, but it's just the tools for you. It's very important to, manage, uh, to measure and monitor um, just to make sure your fence is, is, is all you know, performing to its best capabilities. The one on the right is just a fence alert. It's a simple little alert you can put on your fence and uh, 1.5k away you'll see it'll flash red if there's a problem. Yeah, cool. Um... Right, um, we're going to hold it there, Neil. I think just conscious of time and uh, and giving Dane a chance to uh, to say his bit as well. Um, yeah, we'll take. Do you have, think we've got time for a couple of questions, or do you want to hand over to Dane? Yeah, no, we'll we'll take a couple of questions. Um, so someone's asked um, in regards to tracks, uh, what is the best way to get started? You know, in particular dairy, with the cows crossing twice a day, of course. So sorry, Neil, was that to take power across the track? Uh, the best way to get started with the track. Starting with the track, okay. Yep, um, assuming that's a stone track, then you're gonna to wanna to run a, a single, um, and assuming it's a stone track, and assuming it's for dairy, then you're gonna to want to run a single, um, you'd say 2.5 mil, John? Yep. Yep, high tension track. Yeah, uh, a lot of people use, um, you, know, you run that on, on wooden posts, um, and then on those posts, you'd have a choice of insulators. Um, what would you recommend for dairy, John, to get alongside tracks insulator-wise? Um, I'd stick with the claw. Unless you wanted to put the fence down, you'd use a pin lock. I mean, the beauty of the pin lock is, you know, while the fence is under tension, you can, you know, you can drop them down. Um, if you're moving machinery, you can see it down there on the left. So if you needed to move machinery and it's around a big gateway, you can drop the pin out, drop the wires, and then, pick them back up but I mean the claw is the preferred one you you, you get more performance out of your claw but um, as I say it's it's a choice that's there for you but you can cover both bases uh, we've also got what we call insole tube um, is also a very economical way of getting started so you know a bit of high tensile wire and insole tube 100 mil uh, 3 mil uh, diameter insole tube you know very economical you can get up get going um, and then just up the top there's a, a high strain um, insulator here and we've spoken about the inline strainers there on the right, aluminium. You know, so it's a, a simple procedure. You've been up and running in no time. Yeah, and I know Dane's got yeah. some pictures of his, his tracks. Um, yeah. So yeah, you'll see an example of those in a minute. Yeah. Um, and then a question here. Um, well, it depends on how much work you do up in Scotland, but are you finding enough sunlight in Scotland for the solar energizer? Yeah, feedback from guys in Scotland, John? Uh, very positive. I mean, the technology with our solars is um, you've got 21 days with virtually uh, no sun. Uh, the key thing with them is to give them, when you get them out of the box, is to give them a good 24 hours and some bright sunlight to get them up to speed. But no, we've got some really good results from ours. So um, yeah, and all I can say is um, the new technology, especially with our new S1000, is that they're performing really well. And uh, Alistair Davidson might be on this call up there at um, Paldine. Um, and as I say, very favourable. Um, and um, some really good positive feedback. Yeah, I think a key key thing is is to just be aware of how long a length of fence you're trying to power. And if it's yeah. one joule for 10k, and um, that's 10k of permanent fencing. So if you're on a temporary fence, then probably drop that drop that back to two and a half k. So yeah. if in, in Scotland you might drop that back to 2k or 1.5k. So probably over specking the energizer, so getting a larger panel 
um, with the energy usage of the fence length, you need to power much be a sensible consideration. Yeah, we'll head up to an energy energizer there. Head up, as James was saying, you know, you would a bit more powerful energizer. Head up to a you know six joule, fifteen joule energizer with with a bigger panel. You can go up to one hundred and thirty watt panels. Oh, that's great, thanks. And um, we'll take a final question and then conscious of time, so we'll move on to Dane. And um, I'm shifting to see me. Any tips? Are they not short of grass? Okay, do you mind shipping that? Yeah, I think quite here. Yeah. Shifting cattle every three days in an yeah. eight pad system, but cattle always want things shifted. Um, if they hear or see me, any tips? Um, are they not short of grass? <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, so you know, we find that some cattle get into a routine. So, you know, creatures of habit, they they love a routine. Um, if they're shifted every three days, they'll generally get used to it. So, coming up to that third day, then if they hear someone, you know, they can they can generally be pretty keen for a shift. Um, reducing the on time, so shifting more often. Can help sometimes it, co it coincides with uh, pasture quality and it can also be weather related as well so periods of dry weather we don't and, and high pasture dry matter we generally find animals are very content as we get wetter pasture and unsettled weather then the pasture dry matter drops and sometimes the animals are less content so first thing to be sure of is that they are there is enough pasture for the animals so you know what sort of residual are they achieving? Um, you can maybe do a animal weight gain. If they're gaining weight, then clearly there's enough feed. So check your, pa your, your pasture allocations okay. Consider the weather conditions. Um, and hey, it's, it's quite often phase they'll go through that they'll move out of. Just make sure you're allocating enough feed, and that's, that's not the reason. That's great. Thank you. Um, yeah. so, speaker for tonight, Dane. Um, he's a young stock and grazing manager for Conroe Farm. Pomeroy Farm is a family farm um, operating rotational paddock grazing systems with relatively recent and ongoing um, upgrades to track and fencing infrastructure. So I'll um, yeah, take it away, uh, Dane. Brilliant. Thank you, Nia. Thanks for that introduction. I hope everyone can hear me okay. So my name is Dane Border. As I've presented, it's uh, I'm in charge of Youngstock and Grazing Manager here at JH Vigrinson. I've been asked to talk about the benefits that I have seen with paddock grazing um, on our on our estate, um, look at the benefits, look at some of the infrastructure that we've put on, but also then look at um, how Grass Check GB and being a contributor in there has benefited not only our business, but hopefully has benefited other contributors out there as well. So, just to give you a bit of background, uh, JH Barger and Son is a family uh, family run farm in Wiltshire. We have 750 dairy cattle, uh, 460 followers, and 80 beef. We have a 50 cow point rotary, which we milk twice a day. We employ 12 staff throughout the estate. We have around about 750 acres um not all of which are geographically all in the same area 300 of which are local grazing um we have a um field rotation with pasture so we not only you know when the grass is getting tired or production seems to reduce we then will put that into maize and then wheat on a stop um rotation we do buy in bulk feeds part of our tmr uh with concentrates but one thing that we do is we also work with local arable farmers. As a dairy farm, we produce a lot of dung, not all that we can spread on our fields. So we export it to our local arable business in, in replacement. Um, they also will produce maize that we then haul back in and install in our pits. Um, just to continue on the farm overview, uh, on average, we're about a 9,000 litre average. We milk twice a day. Uh, we're all year round calving with three main groups, highs, mids and lows. We um, do implement a paddock grazing. As mentioned, we do have TMR. The TMR allows me to not only uh, buffer the highs and the mids through the grazing, sister, grazing season um, towards the beginning 
and also the end, depending on whether or not the grass is growing and I've got exceeded demand, um, sorry, exceeded supply for my demand. So I'm quite lucky within my grazing management that I can turn out highs and mids for half a day and buffer them with TMR for the other half. If, for example, um, early on in the season, we've got surplus grass, um, et cetera. Um, we've recently gone to cogent precision for IAI, which we've got great results with. And we've also um, recently in the last three years uh, adopted ICE Robotics, and that's to look at herd health aspects within the business. So looking at improving fertility, lameness and lying times. So how has paddock grazing benefited us as a business? For me, paddock grazing has allowed me to manage large fields as individuals. Um, we split them into paddocks. As James mentioned before, there's a wide range of various different terminology. Um, but effectively, you are splitting a, for example, you can see in that picture, that field is actually a 50 acre field. Now we've split that um, into individual paddocks, but within those paddocks, we actually, and we'll talk about it in a minute, do two feeds with, for example, our low group. So we're also, I suppose you could say strip grazing or splitting those individual paddocks into sub paddocks um, for each feed. One thing about managing individual paddocks is, you know, in a 50 acre field, we all know we've got certain areas of fields that will grow quicker through different parts of the season. We've got different soil types, maybe they're slightly heavier clay or they're green sand and they'll dry up quicker. So we're splitting a 50 acre field, for example, into six different paddocks. If one area of the field is growing quicker than the others, I can target the cows to that specific area quicker to get on top of the grass, because if it was a 50 acre, I would have to start at the beginning or the start of the field where the entrance is and the water and move all the way through. The other thing that it allows me to do is if grass is getting ahead and it gets a little bit higher than what we would normally want to graze, we've got options and toolkits that I have. One of the things is pre-mowing. I go in with the set of mowers and I cut the allocated grass and I put the cows in, only works when it's dry, I have to admit, can't always do it when it's wet. But it means when, for example, you come into a drought or the grass has gone slightly to seed, going by either going pre-mowing or pulling that out for silage, it means you can get on top of that section of the field. And rather than, for example, you get to the end of the field and it's all gone to seed, but you, you can't get to it for whatever reason to make in silage and you've got to push through to graze it, you not only are you potentially wasting wasting potential profit uh, and, and milk gain from within the grass? Um, you also then stunt the regrowth of that um, stunt the regrowth of that grass later on. Benefits of paddock grazing for us is also about recovery and regrowth. If you think of a 50, a 50 acre field, by the time you've grazed. For example, you've grazed that last chunk of grass in that 50 acre field. They've probably back grazed that field 10, 15 times, depending on how many feeds you have in that field. By splitting into smaller paddocks, it allows us to get a closer um, residual to 16 or 1,600 kilos of dry matter. The reason being is one thing I'll come on to in a minute is about measuring and plate metering is I can have a look at a section of that field. If that field, for example, comes back as 1.8 feeds, I can look at another section of field, which is two feeds. And I can jump to that paddock, which is two feeds and graze that first and come back to the one which was 1.8, by which point we're two days later on. And therefore I then get two feeds out of that paddock. Because if I went to an, into it earlier, whereas before moving through a field, I would actually be only be getting either overfeeding one feed or underfeeding two. It also allows me to prioritize better grazing. We all know that, as I mentioned before, in a 50 acre field, some bit might dry up and go a bit seedy. Well, I would want to give that to my lower yielding animals, my lows group, because I want to leave my more leafy and where I potentially get more milk from grass and feed that to my mids. 
so that is why it allows me by splitting up a paddock to be able to prioritize which grass or grazing paddock is better for which groups one of the biggest advantages we've seen over the last five years and it is a progression and still progression we've still got fields which are in our crop rotation that we're looking to divide up into paddocks but as you can see there apart from 2018 which i think everybody knows was a very droughtful year um, we have significantly improved the amount of ton and the reason why we measure the ton tonnage and i've got the values there is because we use a pr uh, product on the online which is called agrinet which where we store and record all of our measurements and all of our paddock information a couple of other things is being able to have multiple groups in the same fields. So in a 50 acre field with a track around the outside and multiple entrances, I can put the Lowe's group in the in the bottom of the field, but also graze the top of the field if that's getting ahead of me with the mids, for example. By having tracks and multiple entrances, you reduce the amount of soil compaction. There's a lot of research these days showing that cows, as we all know, you put them in, set stock them in a field or strip graze them they will always walk the same track to the fresh pressure they will always big pardon they will always follow the same track to the fresh piece of grass or the fresh allocation that you're giving them one thing that's underestimated i feel is water troughs by splitting your 50 acre field into multiple paddocks you will have to look at how you're going to get water to those paddocks now if you've got a 50 acre field or a 30 acre field how many of you have the water troughs near where the entrance is? Now, by the time you get to the end of the field, those cows are gonna walk all the way back for the water. Now, on a hot day, when they're a little bit bothered, we all know dairy cows are quite lazy at times, they're not gonna to wanna to walk another 200 meters back to that fresh grass. What they're gonna do, they're gonna stay around the water troughs and pick the regrowth. And therefore, that field in the long term will take longer to recover. So by splitting into paddocks, it forces you uh, and the business to reassess on how you can maximize the water um, and where you where the water is best suited. The other thing, and the big bonus for dairy staff sticking into paddocks is every time they come in for milking, we give them a fresh piece of grass, is the fact that fence moves are a lot quicker. Rather than that 50 acre field and you put in now a 250 or 300 meter worth of temporary electric fence, they've only got a 50 or 60 or 70 meters, for example, to put out of temporary electric fence between the two permanent or semi-permanent um, electric fence, which we'll show on. By splitting paddocks into smaller groups, you know, it happens to us all. I don't get it all right all the time. I'll put the lows in. For some reason, it might be dry. I might have gone in there a bit too quick after umbilicking or injecting uh, dirty water, and it's not palatable. They go in there, they turn the noses up, and they don't graze it very well. Now, if you've done that on a whole field, that is a big problem to sort out. You may have to go in with tractors, be able to mow it, bale it, and take it off. With smaller paddocks, I use our dry cows. I can stick my dry cows in there for a couple of days. They love it. They'll go and tidy up for me. And therefore, I've reset that grazing paddock within three days so that in 20 days in my rotation or as it fluctuates throughout the season, I can come back to a really nice, pristine, leafy, regrowthed field. The other thing having smaller is you can target things like fertilizer and slurry and dirty water. You know, certain areas of the field, when you do your measuring, may look slightly limier than others and you need to target fertilizer. It also helps us as businesses, as farmers, to reduce the impact. You know, we're always told about trying to reduce our impact. Um, so by splitting it down and then targeting those with fertilizer applications, you're reducing that. We've seen a massive improvement in paddock grazing on our dairy herd and one of the things i'm trying to do now is take those principles into our young stock we've got um, a platform which is not where the main dairy unit is where we raise young stock and at the moment they're in sort of 10 12 acre fields i want to look at splitting them into subfields again so that smaller groups of calves of 20 where they you know range for six to seven months can go and graze and I can rotate them more effectively. Because at the moment, they go in and the grass grows to them, get to the middle of the season, and it all goes to seed head. And then I'm fighting on trying to move heavily and carve young stock to try and eat those, those seed heads and try and maintain the fields. 
So how did we determine on how to look at splitting our paddocks, uh, or sorry, our fields into paddocks? In front of you there, you can see the, the picture hopefully at the bottom. Now that is a 40-acre uh, field. Um, 40, 25, sorry, 25 acre field. Um, we split it into four and five, it goes around the corner, uh, paddocks. So what I did is, how can we utilize the paddocks most effectively for our biggest group? So our biggest group um, throughout the season, grazing season, is our lows, usually on average have about 220 cows. They'll each, they'll each eat around about eight kilos of dry matter per feed. We tend to go into grass pasture at 2,800. When you do a bit of research, you'll see that the leaf growth on the grass, ideally we go in at three leaves. Um, and because of the, the type of seed that we use, that tends to be around about 2,000, uh, 2,800 kilos of dry matter. Uh, within the dairy industry, we try and get our residual down to 16, uh, 1,600. Doesn't always, hap doesn't always happen. Sometimes more realistically throughout the season, that will increase to 17, 18, 19, um, 100 kilos of dry matter because of rejects, etc. But doing that calculation at the beginning of the season with nice lush grass, as you can see there, that picture was taken two weeks ago um, for this presentation. So that is how our uh, pasture looks two weeks ago using grass rotational, um, gives us two feeds. Uh, we divide each of the paddocks up by semi-permanent. Um, I mean semi-permanent because it's just wooden posts with insulators and high tensile wire. There's breaks in the line. Unfortunately, you can't quite see, but up here there's some closer fence posts together. And they've got bungee, electric bungees uh, for gateways. And in here throughout the picture, you can see that we have placed the water troughs in the back part of what would be the first feed. And you will also see that the water troughs are actually placed in line of the high tensile fence. And we tend to put a high, um, insulate the wire across the troughs with a um, rail, creosote rail, for example, so that the cows don't get electrocuted while, while drinking the water, for example. But it means that those water troughs are served by two paddocks. So when I'm grazing the first paddock right in front of you, they've got those two water troughs and you can possibly see some silver in the far right hand side but then go right over to the left and that second paddock they've then got another four water troughs so we can utilize water troughs between multiple paddocks as well but also it means the cows don't actually have to walk that far in order to drink water the way we have built tracks um, it has been an experiment it's taken a few years is we tend to put rubble in the bottom depend depending on if your tracks are cow only doesn't always happen. You will always get farm traffic, tractors, and as tractors get bigger, you do want to invest, if you are going to put in tracks, in making sure that it is fit for agricultural traffic as it gets bigger. Um, so this track here was actually um, put down with uh, rubble in the base. We then put uh, elytic stone down to create a nice hard, uh, firm surface. And then what we've done is used actual AstroTurf um, where you've got us, uh, there's plenty of suppliers in the UK that actually rip up old hockey pitches and football pitches, and they're looking to try and recycle the, the pitches that they got. And one great thing for us is putting the AstroTurf down, and it creates a really nice soft. The first time we used AstroTurf, I have never seen cows run on AstroTurf as if they were put out for the first day on grass on a new track. Um, it really does make a massive difference um, to, 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 to lameness as well. As well, our lameness has suddenly dropped. Uh, our tracks probably were a little bit stony at times, but stony tracks are not a problem. Just chuck the AstroTurf down. As long as the AstroTurf's got a nice firm base, it creates a really nice soft cushion um, for the cows to walk on. So, paddock grazing. The key to paddock grazing is measuring. You've got to measure the grass. The reason being, in order to utilize, the reason being is you want to know when the cows have eaten, how much they've eaten, and also that will then tell you how long it will take for that pasture or that paddock to regrow. As you can see in the picture, oh, I think there was an issue with my 
webcam. Um, hopefully it's not because I'm dragging on. Oh, I am. Right, I will uh, be a bit quicker. Um, key thing to measuring is um, measure once a week. Um, and in peak season is potentially measured twice, um, especially when you're 120 kilos of dry matter. Um, it's to restrict the people that measure. You want consistency. Um, you want to be walking a uh, predefined path, so you're always walking the same area. And you want to make notes on what grazing. As you can see here, one of the fields is coming back, is a little bit limey. Um, potentially that could do with some nitrogen in order to help that. You're looking at rejects and weeds. Um, one tool that we use for recording all of our plate metering um, is AgriNet. And it also gives us a historic comparison and it allows us to do weekly grazing planning and also growth forecast. How has Grass Check benefited us? Well, Grass Check comes out weekly with gross rates, quality comparison. Um, we bi weekly send in our grass sample. I actually tend to try and find the what I think is the worst performing field or, or paddock so that I know that the results I get are my worst case scenario. From that, I can work with my nutritionist to see how many litres of milk I should be getting based on those grass, fresh grass quality results. That then allows me and the business to reduce costs. Do I need to feed more parlor cake? Do I need to feed less? The other thing is reduce costs in feed efficiency. You know, am I, have I got a surplus of grass out there in my paddock? Can I put more mids out? Can I put the mids out full time rather than half a day? Can I utilize that grass? You know, let's utilize the grass. It grows, it's free if it's managed well. You know, it's, it's better to chuck cows out of grass and they eat the grass than it is to have them housed with the light in, electric bedding and feed them TMR. It also allows me, based on that, to be able to maintain body condition, which helps fertility, etc. The other thing with grass check, based on the growth rates of quality comparison, it allows me to forecast the wheat head. Is everybody else in my area seeing grass shortages? Am I coming into a drought? Do I need to start bringing cows in? It's better to bring the highs and mids in and keep the lows out because they will utilize the lower quality grass better. It also helps us as a business to maintain a formal, instruct formal structure. It focuses the business on maximizing um, the profit from grass. So um, as time's running out, thank you very much for, for listening. And I think we will go on to some questions. Sorry, <laughs> dragged on a little bit. No, that's great. Thank you, Dave. Um, so yeah, to just to quickly mention, if you've just joined us and missed earlier presentations, uh, tonight's webinar has been recorded and it will be on the Grass Check um, website. And um, so a few quick questions then. Um, there's one come in here. Um, is there any point in rotational grazing in December, January, February when no growth is happening? Don't know who wants to take that. Shall I go with that one, guys? Um, yeah, so, I, I can. Yeah. Obviously, as a dairy point of view, um, for me and rotational, we um, actually, towards the end of the season, rotate the dry cows um, and those heavily pregnant and also the lows, we keep them out. The limiting factor for us is poaching. Um, so that's really where our rotational grazing ends. But, sorry. <coughs> With rotational grazing, it allows you to get residuals lower so that coming to the end of the season, um, you're, you have everything, <laughs> it's easy to say, ideally you have with rotational grazing, everything under control so that when we house cattle, the winter then allows it to recover so that come spring, the grass growth is at ideally 2A so that I'm turning um, my lows out onto fresh, lush, perfect pasture in an ideal world. Doesn't always work. Um, and one of the tools that I have, if it hasn't all gone pear shaped, is um, we've got a local sheep farmer that comes in and he's very grateful usually for the winter grazing. Um, so that helps as well. So, but for him, it's also great. It's because with it split into paddocks, I can say actually that area of the field didn't get grazed very well. Can you go and tidy that up with your sheep? Um, rather than actually overgrazing the whole field, because sheep, like everything else, if it's got a big 50-acre uh, field, is going to pick the nice, short, 
lush regrowths before they go for the the longer stuff yeah, yeah that's great um, so probably a key key point to make is that um yeah rotational grazing and um, we said we want to get the plants sufficient rest to recover so in the winter when grass growth is slower then the rest period needs to be longer so in winter on a sheep and beef farm we're normally looking to provide 100 to 120 days of rest depending where you're on the country and so what that looks like for a sheep and beef system maybe where ewes could stay out all year if the ground conditions allowed is a, a field that was grazed in november will be next grazed in march so we may still be rotationally grazing but we're just allocating if it's a 100 hectare farm we'd allocate one hectare a day and if that one hectare didn't have enough feed on it for the sheep that we had we would supplement to make up the difference or we'd house or out winter or do something else with a portion of the flock so yes to rotational grazing but it's just managed slightly differently for that period yeah that's great uh, uh, question why graze down to um, 1600 and not perhaps 1500 james they, every every 1500s become if you like that's what should we say industry standard um but every cow is different um and cows are very different to sheep every pasture is also very different so um just for interest dane what's the average weight of your cows um so the average weight is uh sort of 650 um so that that's what we're looking at but the issue for us is um that our fields um because we're on a we do reseed quite often when you're plate metering um a plate meter doesn't always um give you a correct result for example so i can walk across a across a field and certain areas might actually be grazed at 1400 and some of it at 1600 um but it, yeah we, our cows we very rarely struggle um we do struggle to get below 1600 the other thing to bear in mind for other people is you know if you um do graze and cut so for example if you've got a surplus in the early age of the um, in the beginning of the season and you cut that grass mowers don't tend to get below 16 1700 now the issue is when cows go to then graze that they will only go down to what was cut before because it becomes spiky and that presses on their nose and the muzzle and therefore they back off so you might get away with it early on but if you're sort of later mid-season and you go and cut that for silage and then expect to graze afterwards you will not get lower than what you got when you cut that with the mowers yeah that's good really good point Dane. and um the thing with residual is you know every farm is a little bit different the thing with residual normally through the season is to try and keep it consistent um because after you graze to a set residual two or three times then this the grass plant below that height as you Dane was saying like the cutting event becomes more spiky and less palatable so if 1600 is the target, the focus for the businesses are maintaining that target. If 1500 is the target, the focus for the business is maintaining the target. So most people would maybe start the season at 1500 and accept it rises to 16, maybe 1650 as the season progresses, um, and they reset that um, you know, as the season goes on. But consistency will be the key with, with the situation. Okay, thanks. Um, a question perhaps John um, and James. Um, what is the best fence for sheep on stubble turnips? Is it a two or three wires or possibly net? Well, over to you, John. Uh, you just muted for a minute, John. Do you want to flick your mic on? Unmuted. There we go. Yeah, yeah no. Go, three is a better, you know, a better option. Um, you'll get away with two. It just depends on the uh, the volume of the foliage. Um, uh, you, you need you need the power to get through that foliage, but um, you know to say three, I, I would I would probably recommend three, um, just depend on the foliage. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's quite a few questions coming in. Um, is there an app that will split your fields into paddock so you know they're exactly say split into four?
James, I think you're on mute. Yeah, no, so I, I go to unmute myself and then someone mutes, mutes, unmutes me and it goes to me. So I know. Um, there's no specific app that will automatically break the field into paddocks, but there are a number of apps in your app store that will allow you to draw a poly to draw a square or polygon on your phone and see what area it is. So if you search your phone for a map tool or mapping tool or even farm map tool, then you'll get a number of options um, and just most of them are free to use. So try one or two. Um, the nice thing with those tools on your phone is just that um, a bit like if you've used Google Maps um, for directions, you can see where you are. So if you've drawn a paddock and let's say it's a four hectare field you want to split in half, then you can go around the boundary um, on the app on your phone. It will show you where that break fence line is. And then you can go to the field and actually walk or drive that line and then put your fence up on it. So we have a lot of people using that. A lot of dairy farmers using that in the season once they know what area they need to allocate, how we measure the grass, or a lot of beef and sheep farmers using it maybe to set up that four or eight paddock system for the first time. Um, yeah, it's just about that. Um, so, uh, any advice or tips, perhaps, on how rotational grazing differs with non rye grass kind of pastures? Um, this question, the question's come from someone who's got a farm that's too dry to grow good rye grass. Yeah, yeah, cool. So, if you're not growing rye grass, then I um, guess you're growing a clover or herb based sward. So, it might be a, a plantain chicory. Um, and we might have other, other herbs in there as well, but as a rule of thumb, because um, we, we like rules of thumb, easy to follow, um, you would go in when it was 30 centimetres, so that's a foot, 12 inches, and you graze it down to seven centimetres, so that's around sort of three inches. Um, now that, that three inches or seven centimetres isn't going to be like your lawn or consistent perfect height, it's going to be a little bit variable, so you've just got to go with the average. But the key with those swords is to make sure you leave some leaf area and you would leave a higher residual. So in terms of kilos of dry matter, whereas Dane's going down to 1600, then you'll probably be getting down to 2000, maybe 2200 um, on that swap. Yeah, and um, so kind of last question then is to one for you, Dane. Um, does the, um, for your young stock rotation, um, will you run a number of age determined groups and what age would you put calves out to graze? Okay, so um, I, for young stock, um, I've actually done a bit of an experiment again this year um, where we have split some of the paddocks up into smaller. Uh, we took a first cut off, it then came back, uh, and as the grass was growing back to the calves, I turned calves out this year. Uh, at four months, but with a supplementary feed um, of cake um, to help the transition. Um, and I will run ages right the way through to a month before calving. They then come into a transition group with the rest of the herd, um, onto which would be a mix of straw, maize, uh, and a blend um, in order to prepare them, obviously, for the transition in. But with regards to young stock, all ages um, but the youngest I personally will turn out is what I did this year it was at four months and um, four months I've been, I measure every month and we've been getting a, a kilo to a kilo ten of growth rates consistently from there um, historically I've never really turned out to six months and the reason being is we have had issues on our farm with with coxie and we use decox in our cake so I tend to feed the calves and try and get them immunity, well, resistant to coxie with the cake, uh, with the decox in it, up to about five, six months, um, and then would turn out because they've they've got an immune system to various different things. We've also had time to to worm vaccinate um, for husvac, etc., for lung worm with husvac, etc. So historically, it's always been six months plus, but this year we've I've done a trial at four months. And it's worked really well and I probably will follow that on but I think the key thing is is either get in there early with fresh uh, clean pasture ideally after um, first cut of silage especially with the younger animals just because they're more susceptible to um, especially out on fresh grass with things like worms etc okay so that's my advice
That's great. We will take a couple of other questions just because there's so many come in. Um, so someone completely new to um, rotation grazing found a piece, a, a larger piece of land than what they need and concerned about the risks of undergrazing. Um, a very rough rule of thumb, how many raising cattle slash sheep does um, the individual start with? Uh, do they say how um, how big this field is, or or what yes, big how big it is? Thirty hectares. Okay, um, and we haven't got any guidance as to where they are in the country. No, sorry. <laughs> okay, that's um, yeah, that's maybe an impossible question to answer. Um, as a as a very rough rule of thumb, um, if it was thirty hectares of you know, on the average farm in the UK and not thinking about the winter. So we assume they've got, you know, a decent winter option and that's not a limiting factor. Um, if it was sheep, then we'd look at sort of 10 ewes a hectare. And um, that's sort of you twin, you know, ewes that might scan at 170%. If it was cows and calves, we'd look at, um, yeah, one to two cows and calves a hectare. So that's a, you know, a cow and acre or just over a, an acre of cow. Um, if it was growing cattle, let's say it was wean calves um, at 12 months old in the spring, then we probably take it up to four of those a hectare. And that's very, you know, that's a, that's a very, very rough rule of thumb. And the better thing for them to do would be to look at grass check to see what a farm like theirs in their area was actually growing and to then have a look at what their system looked like um, and to speak to people in the area. Grazing management will make a hell of a difference to that farm as well. Grazing management, we could double the number of stock that farm would carry. And obviously winter would be the big consideration. What would be the first limiting factor for that farm? Um, what could be the first limiting factor? Okay, yeah, that's, that's great, thank you. Um, and then final question. Um, in regards to AstroTurf, um, seemingly a cheap means of making a track currently. Uh, do you have any concerns about disposal of it at all? Um, not at the moment, to be honest. Um, it's something that we are we're trying at the moment. Um, it's something we have tried. Where did we put the first bit of astroturf down? It was probably two years ago. Um, it uh, we just sometimes it will tear. Or we'll get patches which are worn, and we put another astroturf layer on on the top. Um, we sort of a bit of an unknown for us. I'm going to be honest. Um, we don't know how long it's going to last and it may get to a fact where we have to dispose it in the future but the cost of potentially disposing it compared to the cost benefits based on uh, lameness, mobility um, etc being able to give cow comfort I think will outweigh any potential disposal costs in the future. Yeah yeah good points um, yeah so just going to kind of round up. A uh, big thank you for everyone who's um, listened today. We've had a really great turnout um, and participation in this webinar. Special thanks, of course, to our three speakers, John, James, and Dane. And um, the recording again will be uh, you'll be able to watch back on the Grass Check TV webinar. Um, and for those who've registered uh, for tonight's webinar, it will you'll receive an email alerting you when um, it's live on the website. So yeah, uh, thank you all, Jacob, uh, and yeah, that's that.